Today, we are jumping into a brand new three-part series of lessons that are called God Never Said That. God never said that. And what we're going to do is we're going to look about, we're going to talk about some different Western culture, cultural belief systems that we have that we've attributed to God for years and years. But the reality is God never said these things. They're not in the Bible. For example, next week we're going to discuss what a lot of people believe is actually in the Bible, but it's not. And people say it all the time. I'm sure you've heard it. Maybe you've said it yourself. It's this misbelief that God will never give you more than you can handle. God never said that. But we love to offer little nuggets of advice and support and sympathy. Maybe we think it comes in handy when we want people to feel better about their situation. Or maybe we want people to have a little more insight into to what's happening in their lives. But what if the guidance that we're giving or what if the guidance that we're receiving from others just isn't true? What if God never said that. Today we're going to talk about a popular misbelief, a myth about God in our American version of Christianity. But before we do that, I want to share some thoughts from a book that was a game changer for me three years ago. Uh, we preached a series on it. It was called Misreading Scripture with Western Eyes. I want, to, I want to share some insights from a chapter titled Getting Right Wrong, but I want to start by sharing the story of the little red hen. Have you guys ever heard the story of the little red hen before? Once upon a time, there was a little red hen. The little red hen worked hard to keep her family fed. One day, while the little red hen was searching for worms, she came across a few seeds. And she asked around to the creatures on the farm who knew such things, the cat, the duck, and the dog, and they all agreed that she had found wheat seeds. When planted, they told her, these seeds will grow into wheat from which you can make delicious bread. The little red hen decided to plant the seeds so that they might grow into wheat that she could break, bake into bread. She asked her friends, who will help me plant the seeds? Not I, said the cat. She didn't want to get her paws dirty. Not I, said the dog. He was too busy chasing his tail. Not I, said the duck. He preferred to float in the pond. Then I'll do it myself, said the little red hen. And so she did. Time passed, and the wheat grew, and the crop needed to be weeded. Eventually, the wheat needed to be harvested, and the harvested wheat needed to be ground into flour, and the flour needed to be made into dough. At each point, the little red hen asked her friends to help, and each time, lazy and leisure-loving as they were, they found some reason to say no. Finally, the day came when the little red hen put the dough in the oven and began to bake her long-awaited bread. The smell, with the smell of it baking, wafting throughout the farm, the little red hen thought to herself, and she wondered out loud, who will help me eat this bread? Suddenly, all her friends had the time in their busy schedules, and they were eager to lend a helping hand. I will, said the cat. I'll help you, said the dog. I will, said the duck. But the little red hen would not have it. Where were all these so-called friends when there was hard work to do? No, she said. You will not eat this bread because you did not help me plant the seeds or weed the garden or harvest the wheat or grind the grain. So you do not get to help me eat this bread. I will eat it myself. And so she did. What is the moral of the story of the little red hen? The moral is you can't expect to benefit from hard work if you aren't willing to do hard work. That's the lesson. That's the message that goes without being said, especially in our Western culture. And whether you realize it or not, we are influenced. We are profoundly influenced by our culture to recognize certain behaviors uh, uh, as good qualities. These certain behaviors are, are virtues, and other behaviors are sinful vices. And, and we are influenced, especially as children, through folk tales like the Little Red Hen, to, to, to believe that these cultural sayings and, and these folk tales are truth, these cultural proverbs like a penny saved is a penny earned. 
the virtue of being frugal. Or early to bed and early to rise makes one healthy, wealthy, and wise. Yeah. That's not just the skill of rhyming. I got mad rhyming skills. That's, that's, that's the virtue of hard work and time management. Or a stitch in time saves nine, the virtue of taking care of your possessions. And you might be thinking like, well, what's wrong with these, Mr. Matt? Like, slow down just a second. My grandma used to tell me all of these, and don't, don't talk about my grandma. Some of these proverbs, these cultural sayings, they sound like they come straight out of scripture, like this one. God helps those who help themselves. God helps those who help themselves. That's where we're going to land this morning with the misbelief that God actually helps those who help themselves. Listen, that's not what God said. It's not in the Bible. In a survey that I read online, which is super reliable all, all of the time, the internet, the cyber, the survey stated that one out of seven Christians, almost 15% of Christians think that this statement is recorded in God's word. And although the saying, God helps those who help themselves, although it sounds spiritual, it sounds theological, it's talking about God helping people, it's not in the Bible. God never said it. This statement, I don't know if you realize it or not, it comes, it actually comes from an ancient text. It predates Jesus Christ by more than 500 years, coming from one of Aesop's fables, Hercules and the Wagoner. Once upon a time, a wagoner was driving a heavy load along a very muddy way. At last he came to a part of the road where the wheels sank halfway into the mire. And the more the horses pulled, the deeper the wheels sank. So the wagoner threw down his whip, and he knelt down, and he prayed to Hercules the strong, O oh, Hercules, help me in this my hour of distress. But Hercules appeared to him, and he said to him, Tut, man, don't sprawl there. Get up and put your shoulder to the wheel, because the gods help them that help themselves." about 550 years before Jesus Christ came into the world. The saying was uh, later appeared in several Greek plays written by Sophocles and Euripides. And then in the 1600s AD, Algernon Sidney, an English political theorist, he first worded the proverb in the way that we're familiar with it today. And 100 years after that, hundred years later, we read in Benjamin Franklin's Poor Richard's Almanac, God helps those who help themselves. In other words, you can't solely depend on divine help. You cannot solely depend on divine help, but you got to work yourself if you want to get what you want in this life. And I can see I can see some of you maybe scratching your head, pushing back on this a little bit because it has been so ingrained in our culture. What's wrong with hard work? That's, that's a good virtue to have. Let's take a look at Luke's gospel account to see exactly how God didn't say this. Excuse me, I think we're going to see that this statement is likely anti-biblical. Luke chapter 7, if you have your Bibles, we're going to start with the first verse. When Jesus had finished saying all this to the people who were listening, all of this is referring to his powerful Sermon on the Mount. When he had finished saying all of this, he entered Capernaum. There, a centurion's servant whom his master valued highly was sick, and he was about to die. The centurion had heard of Jesus, and he sent some elders of the Jews to him, asking him to come and heal his servant. When they came to Jesus, they pleaded earnestly with him, This man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation, and he has built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them. Jesus was not far from the house when the centurion sent friends to say to him, Lord, don't trouble yourself, for, for I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. That's why I didn't even consider myself worthy to come to you. But say the word. Give the command, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority. With soldiers under me, I tell this one to go, and he goes, and that one come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. 
When Jesus heard this, Jesus was amazed at this man. Jesus was amazed at him, and turning to the crowd that was following him, Jesus said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. Then the men who had been sent, they returned to the house, and they found the servant well. Here's the question for today. Do you know whom God helps? If you're taking notes, please write this down. God helps those who trust him and rely on him. God helps those who solely depend on him. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding, but in all your ways you submit to him. In everything you do, you acknowledge God in his presence, and he will help you. He will make your paths straight like this Gentile centurion in his great faith in Jesus Christ, this military leader in the Roman occupation of Palestine, a man of great authority who could have been trying in his own strength and power to help himself in his current situation, he puts his faith and trust in the one he's heard about. He doesn't proudly demand that Jesus come and heal his servant. Rather, he humbles himself. And he says that he's not worthy to have this Jewish teacher even come under his roof. And he trusts that if Jesus simply says the word, if Jesus gives the command, his servant will be healed. And Jesus, he was amazed. He was amazed by his faith, by the man's faith. God helps those who trust him. Now, just a side note real quick. There was another time when Jesus was really amazed it was when he went back to his hometown, he went back to Nazareth, and he was amazed at their lack of faith. We know that God opposes the proud, and he gives grace to the humble. God helps those who trust him and depend on him. God helps those who rely on his strength. I want you to think about it. How could this dying servant help himself? How, how could the centurion command his soldiers to help his servant? Or how could the centurion work hard enough to muster the, the personal strength and willpower to help his dying servant? God helps those who help themselves. There, there's been a psalm that's been just bouncing around in my head um, going back one full month. I don't know if you realize this or not, but it's been uh, exactly a month, one full month since Hurricane Florence made landfall right here on our coast. I want you to listen to the words of this psalm, Psalm 91, and I pray that you are encouraged and, and, and please understand that God did say these words. God helps those who rely on him. If you say, the Lord is my refuge, and you make the most high your dwelling, no harm will overtake you. No disaster will come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. And, and, and here it is in the text. He will call on me. Like the centurion called on Jesus, he will call on me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. God helps those who rely on him. Let's go back to Luke chapter 7 and let's continue reading. Luke 7 verse 11, soon afterward, after Jesus had helped the centurion, and after Jesus healed his dying servant, soon afterward, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out. He was the only son of his mother, and she was a widow, and a large crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said two words. This is what Jesus said. Don't cry. And I'm reading that, and I'm thinking about what she's going through. I'm thinking back to my, my training and, and, and college classes and counseling and uh, psychology classes, and I'm thinking, that's all you got, Jesus? 
That's it? Don't cry? Yeah, Jesus didn't take psychology. He didn't have a degree in, in psychology or, 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 or counseling. He is a great counselor, right? I think in his compassion, he knew, or I know he knew what was about to happen. He went up and he touched the bier, the coffin that they were carrying the dead man on, and the bearers stood still. And Jesus said, young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and he began to talk. I wonder if he just picked up the conversation where he left off, like right before he passed away. And it was just like, yeah, remember this happened and that happened? The dead man sat up and began to talk and Jesus gave him back to his mother. Whom does God help? What we see right here is God reflected through his son, Jesus Christ. What we see is that God helps the helpless. Again, if you're taking notes, write that down somewhere. God helps the helpless. It is the opposite of God helping those who are helping themselves. God helps those who can't help themselves. God helps the helpless. This woman who had already lost her husband, Luke made it a point to include that she was already a widow. And now she loses her only son. She is the picture of helplessness. But, but, but how could she help herself in this season of her life? Could she bring her dead son back to life? No, she couldn't. But thank God that he helps the helpless. Just a couple verses later, staying in Luke chapter 7, we see Jesus, he's sending a report back to his cousin John, John the baptizer. Luke 7, verse 21, at that very time, Jesus cured many who had diseases, sicknesses, and evil spirits, and he gave sight to many who were blind. So he replied to the messengers, hey, go back and report to John what you've seen and what you've heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. All of the people that Jesus helped they were helpless to help themselves. They couldn't heal themselves. And, and when you really get down to it, and, and you look at the character of Jesus Christ, he did not heal them based on their own hard work or their righteousness. God helps the helpless. The prophet Isaiah, he, he, he writes for us, for you have been a strength to the poor, a strength to the needy in his distress, a refuge from the storm, a shade from the heat, for the blast of the terrible ones is as a storm against the wall. God, he helps the helpless. One of my favorite Psalms is Psalm 121. I lift my eyes up to the mountains. We don't have any mountains around here. Um, uh, we, Jenny and I lived three years in the Shenandoah Valley. We were surrounded by mountains. I, I love to, to get to the mountains and, and visit every once in a while. I lift my eyes up to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, who is the maker of heaven and earth. And what we should be seeing right now, what we should be experiencing these days is that, is that God helps the helpless through the ministry of the church. The church is the body of Christ. We are now the hands and the feet of Jesus Christ, serving those, helping those who cannot help themselves. Think about this. How did Jesus respond when he was asked that question, well, who is my neighbor? Right? Jesus said, love the Lord your God and love your neighbor. Love your neighbor as yourself. All right, well, Mr. Smart Guy, who is my neighbor? How did Jesus respond to that question? Yes, he told a story, parable, that's right. He told a story about a man who needed help. In our kids' church classes this morning and preschool classes, they are studying and digging into the Good Samaritan. Help, I need somebody. Earlier in the first service, when just broke out singing, I invited him up to the stage to sing a little Beatles um, you know, our neighbor is anyone that we encounter that needs help. 
And in this broken world, that is everyone we encounter. I, I want to speak. I want to speak just brutally honest with you guys for a moment. Um, I think some of you can relate. In my 40 years, 40 young years, 40 long years of life, um, I've always encountered homeless people. I've encountered panhandlers and homeless people my entire life. Growing up in, in Northern Virginia, I remember taking trips on the metro, on the DC metro in, into, into the city, into Washington, DC, but beforehand, uh, mom, my, my mother, she would line my brother and myself and, and, and my little sister up, and she would give us some spare change. She would throw change at us, maybe a dollar or two. We were like, Mom, what, what is this? Why are you giving us money? And it was for the panhandlers that we would encounter once you got off the, the metro stop. It didn't matter uh, which, which metro stop you got off in Washington, D.C., you would come into contact with some homeless panhandlers. Uh, I, I, I joked around because when Jenny and I were dating, we took a trip into D.C. with my folks, and mom's like throwing out some spare change, and Jenny's like, why is your mom giving, giving us money? It's for the homeless people. This is where I want to be very candid and, 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 and honest with you guys. Um, I was kind of skeptical. Uh, I was kind of uh, uh, maybe even looking back, maybe even cynical of, of the panhandlers in Washington, D.C. Because what I was witnessing and what I was seeing at that point in my life was my dad working his butt off to provide for his family. And when dad's company would go on strike, he would, he would try to find other work, which caught a, a lot of extra grief for him around the holidays. What, what I saw was my mom getting an extra job so we'd have money for, for Christmas presents. So that, that's what I saw. And, and then I think about the, the, the Apostle Paul's words to the Thessalonians, the one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. So mom, why don't you just keep the change? Okay, these people didn't do any hard work to earn this money. They didn't do anything to get it. Um, let's just tell them no. Then, in the summer of 1999, I went out of the, the country for the first time in my life. I went way out of the country to some remote regions of Thailand on a short-term missions trip. And I felt a distinct change in my attitude toward the poor and the homeless. I wasn't as skeptical or cynical of, of the homeless panhandlers in Southeast Asia. In fact, I, I was happy to give generously to the beggars there in Thailand. And, and when I left to come home after that missions trip, I, I left my clothes for the poor people in the villages. I left all of the extra money that I had raised and collected. I, I left it with our missionary, Ezekiel Fish to give to the poor people in the villages, because guess what? I was thinking about not what Paul said to the Thessalonians, but I was thinking about what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, give to everyone who asks you. Share with people. And if anyone takes what, what belongs to you, don't demand it back. Give to everyone who asks you. So I come back to the States, and I see, I see that panhandler flying the sign on the side of the road, I, I kind of revert back to, well, this guy, I mean, he didn't do any hard work. Why is, why is he going to eat the, the delicious bread that I worked so hard to make? So I, I don't know. The, the, the authors of misread, Misreading Scripture with Western Eyes, they talk about this phenomenon happening where, where we go away on a short-term missions trip and, and we become very generous Christians, but then we come back and maybe the moral of the story only applies in America. This is what I do know. God helps the helpless through the unconditional love and generosity of the church. That's it. God helps the helpless through the unconditional love and generosity 
of the body of Christ. And listen, we don't have to travel to the other side of the globe to help the helpless. We have seen plenty of helpless people right here in our corner of the world. Our missionary Ezekiel Fish, who serves in Thailand and Burma, that's, that's one of his phrases, one of his, his, his slogans. Corner of the world. We live in southeast North Carolina. This is our corner of the world. And, and over the last month, we've seen so many helpless people. Some of our, our very own family members, close friends, have been put in a helpless situation. And maybe that is, maybe that's the Lord allowing us to go through trials so we can learn to solely depend on Him. We'll get into to more of that next week with God will never give you more than you can handle. But, but what I'm trying to say is we're surrounded by helpless people. Before Hurricane Florence, after Hurricane Florence, maybe it took a hurricane to get our attention. We are surrounded by helpless people. Here's a wild story. Jenny and the kids and I were standing in line to ride It's a Small World at the Magic Kingdom a couple of weeks ago. And uh, we met a lady and her family from Burgall, North Carolina. It's a small world after all. And we're in the line, so uh, Jenny's rocking a UNCW t-shirt. And so this lady and her family is coming this way in the line, and we're going this way. And I was like, oh, you guys are from Wilmington? Okay, we'll talk next time we come back around. And then uh, how did you guys do in the hurricane? Like every time we crossed in the lines, we were swapping hurricane stories. What she said is, is, is they, they, they fared pretty well in the storm, but half of her neighbors in, in, in their community did not. Uh, terrible flooding, just a, a lot of helplessness. Um, at the hotel where we were staying, the all-star movies, uh, I met a couple from Raleigh who go to a, a Church of Christ in Raleigh, and he had already made a couple trips down to Wilmington bringing uh, hurricane relief supplies to the Pine Valley Church of Christ. He knew Phil Stapp, and I'm just thinking, it's a small world after all. Listen, there are a lot of hurting, helpless people. God helps the helpless through the work of the church. God helps the helpless through the ministry of the church. If you get a chance this morning uh, or, or any time later, uh, I want you to check out this. It's a celebration board right here that, um, that DART ILM, DART stands for Disaster Assistance Relief Teams. Um, it's a partnership with the Venture Church, uh, Cape Fear Christian, and IDES. IDES stands for International Disaster Emergency Services. Um, it, we're just celebrating some of the ministry that's, that's happened. It's not about the projects, it's about the people. And, and this right here, this just barely scratches the surface of the labor of love and the individual ministry that you guys have been involved with in, in your circles of influence. Um, answering the call to love your neighbor as yourself. Now, I do want to say the trap that we have to avoid, and I'm talking like full-on spiritual warfare here, the, the, the trap that we need to avoid from our enemy, the deceiver, the pitfall that we have to be aware of is that we're not doing these good deeds and these good works as a means to helping ourselves. God helps those who help themselves. We have to, with a pure heart, stay very far away from helping the helpless in order to earn God's favor, His grace, His salvation. And we have to stay way far away from working to make ourselves known. Right? We're not trying to make a name for Cape Fear Christian Church or Venture Church or IDES. Our deeds, our good works are evident because of our faith and our dependence on God's faithfulness. And at the end of the day, at the end of a given season, at the end of a chapter in your journey, God must get all of the credit. God has to get the glory. Let's go back to Luke chapter 7 one more time. In verse 16, I want you to look at the response after Jesus raises the widow's son from the dead. 
the people, they were filled with awe. And who did they praise? They praised God. They said, a great prophet has appeared among us, and God has come to do what? He has come to help his people. So at this point in time, they didn't recognize Jesus as Messiah. They weren't, they weren't quite there yet, but they did recognize that God had sent help through this powerful man. And then news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. When we, as the church, help the helpless, this has to be the end result. Number one, people will praise God. And number two, news about Jesus will spread. God helps those who are helpless. God helps the helpless through the hands and feet of his son, a.k.a. the church. And God helps those who trust him and rely only on him. If you're, if you're here today and you, you're a new creation in Jesus Christ, you, you know this. You know this. And, and maybe it's, it's a reminder this morning. You were not helping yourself when you responded to the gospel message. You didn't do any hard work yourself to gain God's salvation. You heard about Jesus and you trusted solely on the work that he accomplished. And, and, and I've been a part of arguments and debates uh, uh, about people, people arguing that, well, confession and, and repentance and, and baptism, that those are works, that it's God helping those who are working to help themselves. But when you respond to the good news of Jesus Christ by confessing, right, proclaiming his name, and by repenting, by turning from the sin in your life, and by being buried with Jesus into his death and raised through his resurrection and baptism, that response was based on your trust and relying on God. God helps those who trust him. Titus chapter 3. But when the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things that we have done. He didn't help us because we were helping ourselves. He helped us because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. As we, as we prepare our minds and our hearts today to share in the Lord's Supper together and, and ha have communion together, and as we respond to the word, as we wrestle with the word this morning, I want to share some, some more passages of scripture that I think we're all pretty familiar with. Um, but I want you to reflect on these Bible verses based on this, this misunderstanding, this misbelief that God helps those who help themselves, because God never said that. But he did say this. He did say this through the Apostle John. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. We love, verse 19, 1 John chapter 4, verse 19, we love because he first loved us. And then listen to these words that God speaks through the Apostle Paul. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your grace. Thank you for doing the work. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for not requiring us to, to work and earn salvation. Thank you for um, the work of the church that we see happening. I pray for uh, a, a, a check on our own hearts. I pray that we would examine ourselves, that we're not earning and, and, and striving to gain any favor or, or, or salvation, grace from you by doing good deeds, but that, but that we motivate it by our faith 
and trusting that you are faithful, are loving you and loving our neighbor as ourself. Thank you so much for Jesus Christ, who, who we're going to take some more time right now and focus on him. He was that atoning sacrifice. He was, he was the offering that, that was a substitute for your wrath. You, you poured it out on him instead of us. And so we praise you for the wisdom of your plan of salvation. And, and we thank you. We thank you so much for your grace. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.